गुड इवनिंग मैम एंड सर एम आई ऑडिबल मैम या यू आर ऑडिबल या या यस सर थैंक यू Uh, I hope you are all having a wonderful evening. I am Stony, the host and program lead of this event. I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all the particip participants present here today on behalf of IEEE Education, IEEE uh, Education Society (YP) Committee and IEEE Professional Communication Society (YP) Committee. Today we are delighted to have two amazing sessions. The the first talk will be on talk on overview of I Triple E dot TV and its opportunities by Dr. Prashant sir. And our second talk will be on securing immersive experiences, communication in extended reality worlds by Dr. Mega Ma'am. Uh, the talk will be followed by a Q and A session where the participants can ask their questions in the chat, and they will be taken up by our speaker. And finally, feedback link will be shared, and then photo session will be taken. Uh, before introducing. Uh, first speaker of this session i would like to click a picture with our first speaker for that i request you all to turn on your cameras participants please can you turn on your cameras Thank you, everyone. Uh, introducing our distinguished first speaker of today's event uh, by Dr. Prashant sir. Dr. Prashant sir is working as vice chairman, Internal Quality Assurance Cell, and associate professor of computer science and engineering at Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetham University, Coimbatore, India. He has over twenty. Two years of teaching, uh, teaching, research, mentoring, training, consultancy, and academic administration experience. He has taught in academic programs in the USA and Europe at the University of California, San Diego, and University of Trento, Italy, and Sofia University, Bulgaria, and. Uh, and as an erasmus fellow he has written six books two edited books one book chapter and over 50 publications in reputed journals books and conferences he has mentored student teams that have won 40 plus premier international and national competitions like the european union urban mobility hackathon ieee humanitarian technology challenge smart india hackathon tcs digital twin challenge and represented india as part of the national hackathon team for the singapore india hack Agathon and felicitated by Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi ji. He has also been ranked as the top innovation mentor in India by Atal Innovation Mission and the top performing innovation ambassador of the Ministry of Education's Innovation Council. Uh, so he has been serving as a chairman. of amrita's internal quality assurance cell since 2009 he has coordinated three cycles of nac accreditation nba accreditation and nirf rankings and served as ugc nodal officer for the university a resourceful organizer and has the distinction of organizing the top four student events in india of major professional bodies namely ieee csi iete and acm let's hear his invaluable insights into the evolution and educational prospects of ieee leader tv and its opportunities we are glad to have you sir thank you please take over the session sir yeah uh, uh, yeah thank you uh, for the very warm uh, introduction uh, uh, respected um, uh, uh, dr mekha other uh, uh, colleagues on the call i see my good friend professor namrita krishnan uh, on the call uh, my friend sai Pr prashant and other uh, uh members of the uh, eds of the I ieee education society young professionals the ieee uh, uh other um, uh, ous organizational units of ieee uh, involved in this uh, event and so on 
so very uh, good evening to you. Uh, I, I'm, I, I guess all of you are in India. I believe you are in London. So it's good, uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And I uh, want to share some slides. I'll, uh, I won't be taking more than 20 minutes on uh, what I'm going to talk about is one, uh, one very uh, exciting uh, opportunity from IEEE, an exciting avenue of IEEE, but not so well known uh, to most of the members of IEEE itself. Uh, so uh, am I audible? Uh, are you able to see the slides? Can you please yes. confirm? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I have been an IEEE volunteer for more than a decade and a half. Uh, you know, I've been, I have served in uh, uh, various positions at the section level, at the student branch level, uh, moved on to regional, um, the regional uh, level, and of course now in the uh, on the board of uh, the MGA or the Membership and Geographical Activities uh, Committee. I started as a student branch counselor of the university's uh, IEEE student branch way back in 20, uh, I think two, 26, 2006 or five, I don't re recall exactly, 2006 or uh, five, I started as a student branch counselor, moved on to the Madras section as an office bearer, uh, as the chair of publications. Um, and so many events I've been doing as part of IEEE, but last four years, uh, I've been editing the Region 10 uh, newsletter uh, and uh, last couple of years, I've been the uh, chair of the IEEE TV Advisory Committee. I also serve as the associate editor of the IEEE Potentials, which is the student magazine of IEEE. So, um, and I understand this is the EDSOC. Um, EDSOC is the main event. I've been a very much associated with uh, IEEE Education Society in the India Council. I used to be the vice chair and secretary. And incidentally, I have a connect with EDSOC or Education Society that the first time uh, the India Council EDSOC chapter won the Global Chapter Achievement Award. That was when I was the vice chair. So that's a lot. It's so exciting to be contributing to uh, education society activities. So I want to demystify uh, this IEEE TV. This is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful avenue from IEEE for the benefit of its members primarily, as also the 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 community at large. And uh, I chair the advisory committee of the IEEE TV. So we have a, a committee, uh, an advisory committee of uh, folks uh, from various parts of the world. Uh, uh, Teresa Brunasso is the region three director. She's the R3 director, but she serves on our committee. Uh, we told Kinsner was the R7, the region seven, uh, formerly region seven director. He's a professor of science in Canada. Uh, Vidya Sagar is uh, based in India, and the uh, Sinati Loy is also from Region 7. He's the treasurer nominee into the committee. So we have a, a mix of people. Uh, and of course, Mini uh, is the uh, Mini represents the uh, IEEE MELCC. I'm sure you folks know about the member engagement and life cycle committee. She represents the MELCC in our committee. So our role is basically to support the IEEE TV. Which, as I mentioned, is uh, is a, is actually a good avenue, but somehow it is not so much well known in the IEEE universe. Uh, I would say IEEE universe because IEEE is a very vast organization with so many regions, um, organizational units, uh, chapters, student chapters, uh, student branches, uh, society chapters, councils. It's a huge organization, and in fact, it's not—it's not a homogeneous organization. It's a massive organization uh, with its share of complexities. So, what we do is we uh, help the IEEE staff, uh, TV staff who are based in uh, in Piscataway in New Jersey. Uh, for we help them with their uh, work. We try to give get them opportunities. We get the we try to advise them on how to engage with the member community at large. I see many of you are from different society, professional communication society, uh, women. Uh, I mean, I'm not WIE, but I understand the Comsoc. Uh, you're from the Comsocs, women cell, WICE, professional uh, society, um, communication society, um, the uh, what should I say, the EDSOC or the educational society. So we try to help. 
uh, understand the requirements of the members at large, the various organizational units, and try to escalate these um, uh, these requirements to the uh, IEEE TV staff. So the TV staff are based in uh, in the head, IEEE headquarters at Piscataway in New Jersey. In fact, I was there a couple of weeks back. We had some board meetings. I just came back to India a week back. Uh, and um, what we do is, uh, what I want to uh, impress upon you folks is that how you can contribute to this IEEE TV. That's, that will be the main focus of my presentation. Unlike Dr. Megha, who's going to be talking about a very exciting cutting edge technology, I'm just going to be giving you some information and volunteering opportunities so as to speak. So uh, our staff, we have a very limited staff number um, uh, in, uh, in the headquarters. But these are the people who are in the staff team. So what is IEEE TV? IEEE TV is basically a wing. Uh, it's basically an award-winning internet-based television network, which essentially produces and delivers special interest programming about technology and engineering for the benefits of the IEEE members and the general public. So basically, it's a television network completely hosted on the internet, on the cloud. And uh, it features a lot of videos uh, about technology, about IEEE events, IEEE OUs, and of course, the cutting edge uh, stuff in engineering. And most of it is available for the general public. But some, act, some things are only for the members. So we have two pillars, so as to speak. One is uh, we we do uh, IEEE TV pro does live production uh, covering the IEEE events and live streaming major IEEE events. However, uh, this is probably not the major activity of IEEE TV. The major activity is hosting videos from the members, from the organizational units of IEEE. That is the lion's share of our activity. Now, the reason why uh, the, I say so that the, the the hosting videos is the bigger pillar as compared to the production and live streaming is because we are constrained by this number of staff who are available for the same. See, I, you know that IEEE is present in 190 countries, you know, but uh, uh, the, uh, the budget does not allow for, uh, as you know, it's a very tightly coupled budget and, and stuff. So we, uh, the IEEE uh, TV folks are only able to produce to do the video production and the live streaming of, of uh, maybe two or three events, maybe five events in a month. That is the bandwidth that they have. They don't have the bandwidth to uh, live stream each and every event. And obviously, they are based in the US, maybe North America. You know, they are today. In fact, uh, the team is they just checked into the hotel a few hours in Ottawa. I, I'm sure my, some of you know that the Sections Congress is uh, happening in Ottawa, in Canada, as we speak. Uh, so they just uh, checked in there and they are doing a live streaming of the event. So basically, the IEEE's TV production is limited to a few, two to five events per month. And primarily, they focus on very big events of IEEE, like, you know, something concerned with the IEEE president wants to talk to people. Uh, live streaming that, producing that, uh, you know, Sections Congress, uh, WIX uh, Honors Summit, IEEE Awards, Seminary, but very few events they can do a live stream. Having said that, we have been, uh, we are uh, hoping for a, uh, a significant expansion of uh, the IEEE TV capabilities, hiring more staff, and perhaps uh, we are trying, we are even in the long run, we are even seeing if we can have a, a crew, an IEEE TV crew in every uh, every major city where, major uh, country where IEEE is operating. Like, you know, China has an IEEE council, India has an IEEE council. We have an office in Bangalore, as many of you know. We are, we are exploring the possibility we can employ and hire crew in all parts where IEEE has a significant presence. So this, this is on the works, but it may not. I mean, I don't know when it's going to happen. That's what we are looking at. Now, um, as mentioned, the, the, the lion's share of activity is IEEE TV. The content is primarily the videos. And uh, uh, we are not so recent. IEEE TV was perhaps started almost a decade or uh, back or so. And uh, now we have 6,600 6, 6, highly technical cutting edge videos that are hosted on our platform. Uh, we have, similar to YouTube, we have 
we are organizing the videos into channels some of the channels are geographical in nature i mean like region 7 events region 10 events some of them are society based you know actually uh, uh, educational society and some of them are even country based or organizational units based but and uh, we also have communities uh, which we have formed out of these uh, uh, channels. So uh, uh, it's very similar to, I mean, you can say that it's akin to YouTube, but YouTube, the scale is much, much higher. We are very exclusive. Uh, we have very exclusive content, which is coming from the IEEE organizational units and the events that are organized by the IEEE, TV, IEEE organizational units in terms of conferences, seminars, or um, interviews and that kind of thing so it's a very it's probably you can you can say it's similar to youtube in that sense that we host a lot of videos 6600 plus videos and in seven seventy nine channels but significantly every year we are adding a lot of videos and this is this is going to expand now we are supported uh, we have some advertising revenue uh, because not like youtube i mean youtube is massive we are not going to we are not competing with youtube at all because youtube has got its own monetization model but we are supported by corporate sponsors boeing has been one of our sponsors in the past and uh, we are also looking at revenue in the sense that there are some people who want to advertise on the IEEE TV platform because it reaches a very niche audience. It's not everybody, you know. Um, I mean, all of us know I have a YouTube channel which has got my technical videos and the, the lectures that I give in keynote addresses. I probably have a few hundred or thousand subscribers. But if I were doing a cookery show, I would have got a million subscribers, you know. So YouTube is kind of all over the map so we are not competing with youtube we are kind of giving a very specialized service now having said that we have a lot of very cutting edge videos are there uh, you know very good videos from our events on renewable energy biomedical engineering uh, recycling so many excellent uh, videos are there highly technical highly uh, focused from very very uh, you know you know celebrity speakers distinguished speakers and so on another thing we do is we we do uh, we do some activity for IEEE in the sense the promotion you know as you know the IEEE presidential election is a very competitive election even though there are only few candidates we give them a space to talk about their charter to talk about their mandate and what they're planning those kind of things also we do on the side for the benefit of the IEEE um, uh, organization as a whole. And as I mentioned, we are only doing very uh, major signature events like, you know, uh, we recently did the VIX uh, Honors Award Ceremony. We are now, the, the IEEE TV folks are now in Ottawa uh, doing the production of the uh, SC or the Sections Congress, very few niche conferences. One of the events that we have been covering very uh, common is the Brooklyn 6G uh, Summit, which is a which uh, is one of the biggest summits on the future of uh, communication technology. And uh, as I mentioned, all of these videos, most of it is available free of cost for anybody, just like YouTube, same model. But we have, because we have IEEE members, we want to give them some privileges and certain things, certain pro videos, certain programs, certain features are only available for the members. Now, we are still debating whether to, uh, you know, restrict or not restrict. But at present, we are going with the idea of having almost everything available for everybody. We have our own app. Now, we are actually integrating this IEEE TV app with the IEEE app. And uh, the, it's new browser uh, neutral in the sense that it doesn't matter if you have an Android phone or a I, uh, Apple phone or you have a Mozilla or a Firefox or a uh, Google Chrome. It doesn't matter. It works across all browsers, across all platforms. To give you a, 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 a pulse of the kind of high value content that we have, just, uh, you know, just this is the kind of thing. We have highly technical stuff like, you know, um, you know, the, um, uh, th this is what we did. We uh, we got content added in the last three to four months. Um, you know, very exciting pro programs like you know uh, a chat with Nikola Tesla. I I'm sure you know that Tesla died more than many years ago. But you know that kind of uh, programs like a documentary. There are so very exciting program done by a professional crew. We also have events, right? You know, IEEE Smart Village, their major event uh, uh, where they 
uh, they kind of uh, showcased what they're gonna do their mandate and so on we have some keynote addresses we have technical lectures on very cutting edge technology all of these are curated in the sense that whatever is uh, given to ieee tv in terms of the uploading we are very curating it very properly and ensuring the technical authenticity to some extent not so much but uh, we do that kind of curation before we do then uh, you know uh, recently uh, winton winsurf winsurf is known as the father of the internet uh, you know he's now uh, he he's the man who behind the uh, internet is one of the founding fathers presently he is the chief evangelist at google but he is known for his contribution and he is an uh, IEEE medal of honor winner and uh, we have the ceremony where, where he was like uh, honored uh, the, the entire proceedings are only available on IEEE TV it's not available on YouTube so that kind of uh, very focused programs are there then a lot of technical stuff there is also a significant channel on career uh, guidance and career uh, progression for student community how to advance in the career and so many videos on that but as i mentioned only 6000 videos but highly technical highly useful highly beneficial um, videos which are very focused for the members of ieee and to some extent the general community you know if i am a scientist working in a university i would uh, the videos that i have on technology is very very exciting very distinguished like but if I am an IEEE office bearer or I work in some IEEE organizational unit, I'm a volunteer, I would probably want to see the other stick. As mentioned, Comsoc, you know, you want to know who are the vice president, who are the who are the candidates for Comsoc. Instead of looking at their profile and doing a Google, you know, you talk, they're talking to you and telling you what they are gonna do if they become elected as the vice president and stuff like that. So uh, the last year was pretty good um, uh, pretty good in the sense that uh, we we were able to uh, do so many things over the last 2022 was good with success we had um, almost 15 very good big production uh, uh, pro of course we were also hit by the pandemic because the pandemic had hit us uh, obviously we couldn't travel a lot but we still completed very 15 major events of IEEE 15 uh, production projects were there. Uh, we completed. We hosted last uh, almost 720 to 20 plus videos last year, and this year we are on uh, we are on course to hit 1,000 plus videos uh, that have done uh, almost 110 hours of live streaming. We had very good uh, traction in the social media, almost 20 percent. So what we did is um, uh, I have to credit uh, my former uh, my the chair of the committee. Uh, who my predecessor, uh, Mr. Bipin Parukur Thomas, who kind of uh, came up, we, all of us conceptualized an ambassador program. And this ambassador program is something that you can also contribute. I will come to that. But uh, basically, we have champions of IEEE. Uh, and um, they have been able to go within their organizational units and get a lot of videos um, uh, hosted on the IEEE TV platform. Now, as I mentioned, how can you help? Yes, there are so many opportunities. We had a call for ambassadors. I'm sure some of you can even now apply for uh, ambassadors. But you, uh, the, the oh, online portal is closed. But definitely, you can drop an email to me, and um, we can see if you've got the skill set. We can become a ambassador. But basically, what we are looking at is uh, an, uh, an ambassador is somebody. Uh, who will be uh, who is probably concerned or connected with the information management in your organizational unit in the sense that you coordinate the website the social media channels the videography photography those are the people who we are who are ideally suited to be an ambassador so we have already i think this year we have recruited almost 20 ambassadors and i think across five six regions but we are on the lookout for more ambassadors if somebody is really excited and they have a lot of videos and stuff like that please write to me and uh, i can uh, i can enroll you as an ambassador but the idea is uh, even if you are not an ambassador the idea is you 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 look for ieee tv in addition to youtube i am not saying you don't go upload your stuff on ieee on youtube if it is able to get you more uh, more views and more uh, and hopefully some monetization there's no harm but we we are advocating there are many people who don't want to put it on youtube because it's lost in the in the it's a huge uh, what is that 
huge archive. It's lost. So many people don't put it on YouTube because they don't expect that to get uh, so many views and uh, which will end up in monetization. So we are having an IEEE first initiative. Many people are now hosting only on IEEE TV, very niche. But we, as I mentioned, we do a curation. We have to do a curation. You can, anybody can upload um, a, a, a file. There is a form. If you're an IEEE member, it will ask you for some stuff, some details, which section you are, what you are doing, what are the keywords or the metadata. And any video can be easily uploaded from your computer, which is less than 1 GB. Now, if you have any file that is uh, more than 1 GB, you just write to IEEE TV. Then we have a different way to the, currently the software, the various platforms like Drupal, Drupal, Wavza, and all don't uh, accept anything more than a GB. But we can have another method to put videos that are more than 1 GB. We talk to our technical, you write to me. I will uh, connect you to the technical team and ensure even if the video is more than 1 GB, I will get it uploaded. So that is a wonderful uh, platform. One is you can become an ambassador, write to me, uh, send me your portfolio, how you can contribute, how you can add videos. I'll be more than happy to enroll you as an ambassador and so on. And if, even if you are not interested in taking up an ambassador role, you can champion the IEEE TV. Everything is available online. Just try IEEE TV and you can upload your videos and I'm rest assured you may not get hundreds of views like YouTube but you will get people who kind of uh, are interested in what you are doing it opens uh, vistas for collaboration and networking and that kind of relationships are possible so that is a big uh, takeaway from me because it is highly uh, niche curated content uh, now uh, another thing is that you know we we are looking with uh, we are looking in fact our committee is looks for the best practices in the industry looks for what are what is needed from the members members point of view the volunteer perspectives what are the important what are the latest developments in terms of internet television uh, production presentation marketing how to build the IEEE brand how to like another example is MGA membership and global uh, geographical activities unfortunately we are concentrated in a few countries IEEE membership if you see the pattern a lot of business in India China US these are few you know um, uh, areas where the lion share there are many countries which are underserved but how do you take IEEE to those people to the to the unreached people you know Africa sub-saharan Africa um, uh, parts of Central America, uh, Southern America, Latin America, so as to speak. So we, we do all those kind of things. We uh, take the inputs from the members and use this platform for the membership growth and uh, and so on. And of course, advertising, you know, if you can get um, uh, help with uh, somebody wants to promote a highly technical product among IEEE members, uh, you know, it, this is a good platform. It may not have the reach of uh, uh, YouTube, but definitely it will, it has a very good reach in terms of the people who are going with the views that we are getting, which are running into several hundreds of thousands. That kind of thing is there in terms of this. So these are the ways by which you can volunteer. Moving forward, I can give you a quick roadmap. What we are doing is we are going to we are going to seamlessly integrate with the collaborate tech. I believe volunteers know about Collaborate Tech. It's like a social media platform where you communicate, you share files, a workspace, so as to speak. We are trying to integrate very closely with uh, Collaborate Tech. I, already we have an integration with Explore, but then Explore is like you know peer-reviewed papers. Many of these peer-reviewed papers we are seeing how we can map to the videos and stuff like that. We tools is another thing that we are exploring. I have not been able to. Uh, do this, but next uh, month end we are having a board meeting in uh, in uh, Baltimore where we will work how to integrate with this thing. And as I mentioned, IEEE TV make it the first choice because it's it's better, it's focused. You get that audience that you need. You may not get money, but you definitely get the audience. It opens vistas for networking, collaboration, and such. We are also looking at how we can incentivize uh, member uploads and viewership. Maybe in the long run. How do we uh, get some kind of monetization like the YouTube model? But it's that is a that is not in the near future. It, in the near uh, in the immediate future, it will take time. And of course, advertisement. So this is what we are uh, doing for IEEE TV. Uh, this is the overview of this uh, thing. But unfortunately, I want to tell you that uh, somehow many people don't know about the uh, this uh, this uh, this really 
exciting avenue from IEEE, which gives you a lot of visibility in, especially in the technical uh, community. So as to excuse me, sir. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I am done. Yes. I am done. Okay, 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 sir. Yeah, we started for seven, eight minutes late, so I kept my time. Yes, Actually, sir. I'm done. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, so, uh, questions are at the end. Am I right, um, Sony? Sai? Yes, yes. Okay. So, okay. I'll just. Uh, what time is the? Uh, should I join for questions? Like we'll have it now only, sir, and okay. then we'll have a second yeah, session. I'm I'm open for questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, Navin the Krishnan sir. Hello, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, hello, all. Hope you are doing well. Thank yeah, you so thank much you. Uh, for your uh, insightful session about the IEEE TV, which is per se uh, highly unexplored area by uh, at least uh, IEEE India Council, people who are in India, IEEE members. So uh, it's a good initiative. And a uh, couple of times we also tried uh, you know, collaborating with IEEE TV for SS12. Uh, my question is, uh, Professor, uh, is there a review mechanism uh, in IEEE TV? You know, when, when someone uploads a content, will you review it or how the process works? Uh, sir, uh, when we are uploading a video on IEEE TV, we have, there is, it's a long form, you know, you have to give the metadata, who is the author, who are the co-authors, what are their contact numbers, who are the IEEE. So that takes care of a lot of the authentication. Because they are, we look, we look at their membership, their contact details, their affiliation, which section they are from, which OU they are from. So all those things are part of the form. It's a long form. It takes time to fill it, at least seven to ten minutes to fill it. At the same time, it looks for metadata on what it is. You have, you have to give the metadata, the keywords. Now we uh, generally do. We do not do a very, uh, what should I say, a very uh, extensive peer review. All the videos we do, we do a kind of a due diligence check for the entire video. The because he ultimately, um, you know, already the organizer. So if you are talking about Brooklyn Six G Summit, the I mean, who who is going to be talking in the Brooklyn Six G Summit is the people who are working in Samsung in Six G or Motorola in Six G. So they are in the bleeding edge of technology. So we don't uh, we look at the entire videos and see for its content and all. We don't do a kind of a peer review and all. We look for the uh, due diligence and then we uh, think more or less. I would say that maybe the uh, rejection is probably one or two percent. Some videos where there are some kind of uh, probably some uh, untoward incidents or some unparliamentary words. We have asked, we sent it back and asked them to cut that part and send it back. Those kind of things we have done, you know, by mistake, you know, some people will sometimes, uh, you know, make mistakes and stuff like that. So that is our um, uh, credo in terms of the content. Now, uh, what we are working is, uh, you know, in, when you do IEEE Explore, uh, you get some papers, right? Uh, now, what we are working is some sort of, uh, uh, what is that, uh, web crawler, I don't know, agent, you know, I would say it's an agent or a crawler wherein you you search you will you will get the IEEE explore the papers that are in this area and uh, associated content and videos this is what we are working at but it may not happen in the next three to four months we hope to finish this off collaborate already is showing um, you know showing our results you can put the video share the video and put the link in collaborate that kind of thing is already on but we are working towards more integration I'm sure, sir, I'll, as the chair of the IEEE Education Society in the Madras section, looking forward to your uh, this thing. And we can even see how we can partner in terms of, um, I mean, uh, maybe production is a problem, but we can definitely, uh, moving forward, when we have the crew in Bangalore, we can see how to take the, the, those things. But it may take time. But we can host all your major events, including the assist. We can do the complete hosting. Uh, there's no issue, even if the the files are bigger just contact me i will get it done definitely sir thank you thank you so much hello dr prashant sir very good, good evening this is hello sir hello sir yes sir uh, th thank you so much sir for ki kindly accepting my invitation sir yes. my question is like this program 
uh, is uh, is an exclusive only for a selected people of 20 to 25 people, sir. Like we have gone with an what you call an uh, evaluation process, and we have been selected somewhere at 25 people. Yeah. Whom will be what you call uh, uh, whom will be what you call uh, recognition from the IEEE Education Society of IP. Yeah. So basically. Through this program, we have been somewhere around uh, doing somewhere around uh, 17 to 18 programs focusing on leadership, technical knowledge, as well as on the different IEEE platforms and uh, different, uh, what you call, uh, career op opportunities. So right. basically, all the 17 to 18 uh, sessions are completely recorded and we have a complete, what you call, a repository. So, uh, what you call, actually, we are uploading them on our, what you call, YP Edusoc page. Yeah. So now, what we wanted to do is even we wanted to share this a complete repository to the itw.tv so how can we move forward in this direction so that's my question sir yeah thank so you what i will do is uh, see rather than you know i don't want you to uh, you know i want to give you a very focused solution so what i will do is i will set a meeting with the uh, itw.tv office not now as i mentioned everybody is busy in the sections congress i will uh, you you send me what you can do as a homework is that you send me the list of uh, all the events uh, um, or the links of all the events uh, and um, i'll do, i'll send it to the people the committee members advisory committee members as uh, as also the ieee tv staff and then uh, we will get back to you probably we will have a one to one session so that you don't have to break your head make it simple for you to upload i'll figure out some method for that but give me a little time as i mentioned all of them are in uh, Ottawa, after they come back from Ottawa, I think they'll take a week or vacation or something. So uh, contact me. You send me all this now itself. And uh, probably by uh, the end of the month, uh, I will give you an answer. Sure, sir. De definitely. And sir, one more thing, sir. Actually, we are also planning for a offline, like an hybrid kind of uh, an, uh, and summit kind of thing, like yeah. a YP leadership summit. So even further also, would it be possible to go live on the ITB.TV for, for, for an hybrid kind of event? So the problem with the um, live in the sense that the problem is the, you know, when you are doing a production, right? You need yes, the video camera, you need the, the, the phone. They have to come from, they won't be able to come from US. Yes, so uh, live streaming is a little difficult. That is a fact. Unless we have a crew in the IEEE office in Bangalore, we cannot do that as of now. But what we can do is, uh, we can, you can, um, as the chair, I can give you the option that, you know, um, you can even market that, uh, that your summit is going to be exclusively available on IEEE TV. That kind of thing I can get you, provided you don't do it in, uh, you don't put it in YouTube. And yes, you, we can you can use that as part of your pitch or your promotion pitch about that that part like you know partnership with IEEE TV all that I can get it approved but you need to send me a formal mail and requirement and I have to discuss with the committee. That's sure, sir. We can do that. Sure, sir. De de definitely, sir. I'll just get 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 back to you on this, sir. Thank you so much, sir. In fact, uh, wanted to share with you. We had a what is that IEEE history uh, what is that milestone I'm, I'm sure you've heard about this yes, IEEE milestone uh, three two years back we were exploring if uh, the uh, people could come from the US See, IEEE milestone is a big deal you know uh, you know I think in India there is only one milestone uh, from that Pune what is that some radar thing is there you know that uh, radio yes, sir. Yeah. the industry from the Pune yes sir yeah 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 so that is the only IEEE uh, milestone in India uh, as, uh, as a whole, we are looking, there are been a lot of, uh, uh, no, there is one more that Jagadish Chandra Bose in Calcutta has done some, the first, uh, some radio, uh, millimeter uh, wave radio experiment or something like that. I think two, there are two in India, but uh, in Japan, there are 30, 40 milestones. So we are looking for those things. And we, I was even suggesting that the whole IEEE TV crew should come to India to do that because it's a, it's a historic event, you know. Getting an IEEE milestone is a historic event. There are only two in India, right? So those kind of things, may, we may be able to convince them to come down from US uh, and so on. Uh, yeah, sir is telling, uh, G, uh, correct, correct, correct. Yes, sir. GD Naidu in Coimbatore that uh, there is a museum of something. The people are working on that. But it takes time. It's a long process. Those kind of major events, we, were, we are seeing if the IEEE TV crew can fly down from the US. So this the partnership is great. We just send me a drop in an email now itself. Do it as early as possible so that I can put it in the next meeting. The next meeting is planned 
uh, I think by 20, between 21st to 24th. So before that, please send me all the details and I'll approve your partnership. And all the videos we will host also. Sure, past, sir, sir. And future, past and future videos. Sure, sir. Definitely, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Welcome. And thank, thank you for sir. time, sir. Thank you, sir. I have put my email ID in the chat box. So if anybody is uh, wanting to uh, you know contribute and just uh, drop my email for official reasons i am uh, my university i am required only to uh, whatever i do even in the professional society i am mandated to use my official un university id so i don't i have an IEEE id but i use the university id that is the mandate from the administration for me so i am uh, put that uh, id prashant at amrita.edu p r a s h a n t at a m r i t a dot edu Yes, uh, Tony. Yeah, you can please move it. Thank you, sir, for cultivating and enlightening our audience through your IEEE.TV. And thank you so much, sir, for answering our attendees' queries. And thank you, sir, for uh, giving us insightful talk on how we can contribute in IEEE TV and hosting videos from organizational units of IEEE. And thank you for explaining about career guidance and the roadmap of 2023 uh, integration of IEEE TV with Collaboratech V Tools and Explore. Uh, on this note, I would like to present token of appreciation. Sir, is my screen visible? No. No, sorry, no, it's not visible. You can reshare it once again. Okay. OK, is it visible now? No, something is coming. Yes, yes. Maybe, yeah. maybe you can do it uh, full, full screen, yes. OK, so on this note, I would like to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Prashant, sir, for sharing your experience and insightful session on IEEE.TV and its opportunities. Yeah, thank you very much. Please send me this as an email. I'll post it on my LinkedIn and uh, Facebook. Yes, I'll sir. i sure. on the official. Uh, channels of IEEE thank you yes yes sir we'll do it sir thank you sir once again for giving us your time thank you very sir, much one of the participants is asking like your complete deck sir presentation deck maybe uh, i'll yeah, reach you on the email sir yeah I, i'll send it to you no issues i can send it sure to you. sure sir. thank you so much sir. okay thank you very much bye bye uh, 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 thank you the, hello doctor um, uh, over to you. Sorry, I think I the questions took another four or five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now welcome you to the second talk by Dr. Mega, ma'am, for an enlightening talk on securing immersive experiences, communication in extended reality worlds. I feel privileged to read the profile of Dr. Mega, ma'am. She is a research associate in the Horizon EU-funded SERMAS project in the Department of Informatics at King's College London, UK. She received her PhD in Computer Science and Telecommunications from the University of Toulouse III, Paul Sabatier, France, with a thesis about the interplay between safety, security, and system architecture. Before this, she received her Master of Technology degree specializing in cybersecurity from the National Institute of Technology, Kurukshetra, India, where she conducted her master's research on a DRU funded project on smart card security. Current Currently, Mega Ma'am is serving as the member at large in the IEEE Comsox Women in Communications Engineering Committee. We are delighted to have you today, Ma'am. Thank you. And I hand over the session to you, Ma'am. Please lead the session. Thank you, Ma'am. Thank you very much, Sony. So I will be sharing my screen. Yeah. I hope is uh, it's visible, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, first of all, uh, Sai Prashant, for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to be here today. And a very uh, good evening to all of you. Thank you for your presence. Uh, well, Sony has already introduced uh, about me, and I will not uh, cause any more delays uh, regarding my profile. So today I will be speaking to you about securing exchanges in the extended reality realm. 
And of course, if you have any questions, uh, please make a note of them. It is going to be a technical talk. I'm not sure about uh, all of your profiles, but I hope it will be uh, interesting to you. And if you have any questions, I will address at the end of the talk. So uh, before jumping into the technicalities and jargon of this topic, uh, let's have a look at some of the real world cases from the past. So uh, this Cardboard Mid headset is part of the open source Cardboard software development kit, which allows you to build immersive uh, cross-platform virtual reality experiences for Android and iOS uh, with essential VR features such as motion tracking, rendering, and uh, user interaction. You can build entirely new virtual reality experiences or enhance existing applications that support virtual reality. Uh, apparently, there was a vulnerability reported in this kit pertaining to the VR experience generation. Uh, this vulnerability basically sends users personal and sensitive information, like details of the uh, manufacturer, uh, details of the model of the device that you are using, the hardware and software, et cetera, as unencrypted plain text to a third party website, uh, which is used for collecting Unity 3D statistics. So Unity 3D is basically a company which is dealing with uh, 3D modeling of uh, virtual reality environments. It's like it is responsible for creating gaming engines also. If some of your engineers who are working in the field of computer science or uh, electrical or electronics engineering. So um, next, uh, what you can see is a standalone virtual reality headset, which was developed by Oculus. And Oculus is a subsidiary of Facebook, which now goes uh, with Meta. Uh, Oculus warned its users to sit in a safe place before using the headset for an immersive experience. Uh, otherwise, they might get hurt by hitting stuff uh, placed in their surroundings. And apparently, this headset has been discontinued by Facebook uh, with the aim of developing better and more powerful headsets with uh, improved experiences. And lastly, if you can recognize this, it's a picture uh, which is depicting the metaverse. And metaverse is nothing but uh, a virtual universe existing in parallel to our physical world, where people can interact with each other and digital entities in immersive and interconnected environments. So I'm not sure about uh, if you are aware of one of the weddings that was organized in the, uh, in the Tamil Nadu state on the metaverse. So you, it's quite interesting to know, and you can uh, catch up on news about that. And of course, a survey was conducted, which uh, shared the social experience of uh, over 600 virtual reality users. Uh, and the survey found that a significant percentage of people reported racist comments, and they experienced uh, violent threats and sexual harassment. So all these incidents and statistics reflect security including safety and ethical concerns as paramount considerations in extended reality environments to ensure a safe and secure Excel experience for protecting users, their information, and their interactions, of course. So um, let's now go into some of the technicalities of extended reality realism. Uh, extended reality is nothing but uh, an idea which encompasses immersive technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. And these technologies combine elements of the real world and virtual world to create a new reality. And hence, the name is extended reality. So in this picture, you can see a representation of the virtual uh, virtuality continuum, which was adapted from the uh, Milgram's contribution in the scientific literature. And in the context of virtual reality, Immersion is basically a condition in which a user loses awareness of the fact that they are actually in an artificial world. So let's see uh, one by one uh, what these technologies, uh, including VR, MR, and AR, they mean. So uh, what reality means to you, first of all? It is something that you see in your uh, surroundings uh, that you can perceive through your senses. So we have got uh, eyes to see, we have got ears to hear, we have the sense of touch, taste, and smell. So all these senses, they help us to perceive our environment. But uh, virtual reality, on the other hand, it's something which involves supplying virtual uh, uh, things to the senses so that they seem like real to us. So in other words, it's like a fully enclosed synthetic experience where the user can interact through specialized controllers and hand tracking technology. 
so according to me it's like a dream world whatever you see while sleeping uh, which is ex uh, actually not existing it's similar to that and if we move ahead to augmented reality it's quite the opposite in which uh, the real world is basically enhanced by augmented augmenting digital information and virtual objects so um, this is mainly experienced through smartphones tablets smart glasses and headsets so in the picture on the right if you can see that a person is holding a phone and uh, he or she is basically capturing the surroundings but there are two objects uh, one is basically a text uh, calling pikachu and there is a picture of pikachu the cartoon itself so these two objects are actually not existing in that environment but they are being embedded uh, to what the user is uh, seeing uh, in his phone and coming to mixed reality it is nothing but a combination of virtual reality and uh, augmented reality where digital objects and information are integrated into the real world environment and they interact uh, with it in real time so here uh, the object has an awareness of the physical world environment and what i mean by awareness i will explain in the next slide so let's uh, take a look on this example here like you can see a small child he's uh, wearing a, a head mounted display it's like a headset and he is trying to uh, visualize a table and a ball so this is like a virtual environment for him whatever he is seeing here and he is basically uh, feeling like he's part of that environment he's playing with the ball but in augmented reality on the other hand uh, it's the opposite the the primary world is the physical environment of course and then uh, we can synthesize a virtual object which will become a part of that environment but here the object uh, as you can see which is the ball it is not able to uh, determine the, the placement of the table so you can see the ball is basically going down it is passing through the table which exactly is not possible in real life so in mixed reality what happens is the ball will be actually aware that there is a table in the physical world and this ball will not pass through it so i can say here that the ball is aware of the table but actually it's a non living thing right awareness is basically a capability of humans but not a non living objects so this ball what exactly happens is uh, will be interacting with a virtual copy of the table so in mixed reality there will be an exact mapping of the physical table which is uh, not um, visible to the users wearing the headsets but the ball will be aware of the presence of the table in that sense and that's why it will not pass down it will basically bounce back from the table so um, coming to the applications of xr after these technicalities well it has a wide range of applications uh, surmounting industries like uh, training design uh, in, uh, that are involved in enhancing experience of the users and for instance you can see here in the picture that uh you can translate words to your preferred language using the camera app from google so i think most of you must have tried if you have traveled abroad or even in india if you are visiting to a different uh state having a different language then you can use google translate and with a uh, live camera feature you can actually translate the words of those languages and uh, likewise we have this picture on the right side where Uh, it's an application related to the healthcare uh, industry so this is basically a face your uh, fear phobia app which uh, provides audio instructions from the therapist to think in a more positive way so it helps you uh, to identify your specific phobia its symptoms and how to deal with it so let's say if you are scared of spiders or lizards then you can use this app in order to you know train your mind to not to be afraid anymore you can actually synthesize an environment where there will be spiders and then you can try to get rid of this uh, fear and coming to the next uh, application which is from airbus a320 and i will be playing it airbus so. is introducing a mixed reality concept for a320 family cabin customization and design For decades now, Airbus has embraced digital developments that combine the latest technologies with our pioneering spirit of innovation. Now we're opening a new era where mixed reality will help shape the future of cabin definition. We're introducing the Airbus Immersive Remote Collaboration Concept to transform the way we work with our customers. 
factors right from the earliest stages cabin definition. Wherever they are, our customers can tailor their cabin to their own detailed requirements. This three-dimensional environment benefits from a new, immersive experience. It's easier, more efficient and exciting. Mixed reality brings the cabin to life. Thanks to holograms, users can simulate the handling of physical objects. They can test various configurations and colors, check accessibility and even open doors. The Airbus immersive remote collaboration concept is debuting on the A320 factory, opening the door to a promising future for mixed reality applications within Airbus and beyond. Yeah, so uh, I hope the video was visible to all of you. So in this, you could see that uh, Airbus A320 is basically using the extended reality technology to train their cabin crews. Uh, for instance, they can simulate the environment, uh, which will be similar to the actual uh, environment when passengers are traveling, to train them with uh, whatsoever possibilities are there regarding the operationing or regarding any critical scenarios related to safety of the passengers and so on. And uh, moving ahead, it's like another application. Uh, so if uh, some of you are faculty members uh, who are attending this session, they can uh, extend their classrooms with mixed reality in a very easier manner. So there are simple tools uh, where students can immerse themselves in learning and dive deeper into each subject. And mixed reality basically will break through emotional barriers so that students can experience life from new perspectives. Uh, and with this immersive technology, you will create a setting for learners to collaborate and give them access to uh, once out of reach experiences. And likewise, uh, uh, the XR technologies uh, are transforming industries by allowing architects to create improved design visualization and to create highly immersive and interactive visual representations of building designs. And this will in turn allow clients and stakeholders to experience the design uh, as if it were real. So despite these encouraging applications, uh, extended reality also introduces uh, some uh, cybersecurity concerns of its own type. And this is mainly due to the immersive nature and integration with uh, various devices and networks. So we will have a look on those uh, concerns one by one. So uh, regarding the first concern, which is uh, indeed hacking and unauthorized access, which is common to all sort of networks uh, nowadays. Uh, first is like eavesdropping, where researches show that hackers are able to monitor people day in and day out activities. Uh, they listen to what they are saying, and they can see how they are interacting in virtual reality. Well, uh, the thing is like when you are using the technology, you cannot see the hackers, but the hackers can see you and they can hear you. And it's like an invisible peeping tom where a different level, layer of privacy is being invaded. And another kind of attack is man in the room attack where attacker can join any collaborative meetings like the ones we are having right now if we are making use of uh, extended reality technology without uh, the permission uh, taken from the users and they can indeed modify the environment. And next is like man in the middle attack in which the attacker can intercept or monitor communications between the XR browser, XR provider, and third party servers. Followed by tracker attack in which uh, they can actually turn on your front facing cameras and they can stream the video uh, feedback uh, to the desired location. Like uh, they can basically capture your uh, videos and they can transfer it to their own uh, personalized servers to manipulate the information, to you know, tamper with the information. And of course, uh, there is another thing in which the profiles of the users are being created in the extended reality environment. So all your biometric details are being stored at the servers. And then attackers can actually tamper with that information. Uh, and in turn, they can cause denial of service or uh, unauthorized access to the user's records. So there have been incidents in the past, and um, yeah, people are actually working on improving these technologies to address these concerns. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, area is malware and ransomware related threats. So malware, if you all are aware, uh, they are basically malicious software. The term stands for malicious software, and they are designed to infiltrate the systems 
to steal data and to disrupt operations or to gain unauthorized access. So in an extended reality environment, a malware can be pervasive nature. So XR hackers, they can undermine the security by redirecting users to the malicious websites or malicious servers with illegal content. And they can actually make you see what you don't want to, what you don't intend to. And this is done by uh, you know, luring the users to click on advertisements or links in the virtual reality environment. So this is nothing uh, uncommon. It's even in our day-to-day -day life when we are uh, you know, scrolling through the web, uh, we have to be a bit careful before clicking any link. We have to be sure that it's an authorized link and it will not lead to any redirections which are not intended to. So uh, next category is ransomware threats in which uh, the data breach, it's like a data breach attack in which the attacker will record the behavior and interactions of the XR users uh, during the immersive sessions. And they can later threaten the user to release these recordings publicly unless the user pays a ransom. Uh, and especially a dangerous area that hackers can target is the healthcare industry, where uh, when they gain the access to the XR healthcare devices, they can target the patients and clinical staff and course them for money before giving the control back. So for instance, if doctors are you know, conducting surgeries and in between um, the attacker jumps in and will try to block the access to the, to the extended reality technology, and then they can uh, ask the people who are responsible for the surgery to pay back in order to let them or to allow uh, using those uh, extended reality toolkits for proceeding with the surgeries. And of course, this is in turn related to another kind of attack, which is known as denial of service attack. Uh, and uh, it is nothing basically but, uh, you know, disrupting the availability or functionality of the extended reality systems, uh, data applications or services. And the idea is to basically overwhelm the targeted system resources, causing it to become slow, unresponsive, or completely unavailable to the users. And this can have serious implications uh, in critical situations, as I mentioned uh, during the surgical procedures. And uh, another interesting area, which is like deep fakes and misinformation, in which a hacker can basically get access uh, to the monitored body movements of the users from the XR headsets. So when you're using the headsets or you're uh, using any other sort of extended reality device, they can actually track your body movements and they can generate deep fakes or digital replicas uh, of you. And basically these uh, deep fakes can convince uh, other parties or the random public uh, in order to, you know, uh, affect the reputation of the user to which they actually belong to. And they can allow for social engineering attacks as well as they can cause political uh, instability. So there was an incident in which uh, there was a replica generated for uh, the ex-president Barack Obama in US and it was being uh, used to spread misinformation in the, in the society during the voting period to basically defame uh, his reputation. So. Moving ahead, we also have uh, some concerns related to the privacy and personal information of the users. So, um, for instance, um, there is a notion of uh, consent and data ownership. So, users they should provide informed consent before uh, their data is collected and used within the XR applications, because there will be sensors used to collect uh, the biometric information of the users, which will be forwarded to the XR application. So uh, this uh, information should be made available to the application based on the consent of the users. And this consent should be granular in nature so that users can provide specific permissions based on the type of data collection and the purpose of uh, the data being used. So uh, for instance, a user can give a consent uh, to movement tracking, but not to uh, biometric monitoring. And also uh, regarding the control, users should have control over their data. And this includes the ability to review, modify, or delete their data, as well as to opt out from any uh, data collection practices. And they should also have the right to withdraw their consent at any time. 
So if the data is being collected, initially they gave the consent, but in later stages, they can also revoke that grant. So this principle basically aligns with the idea that consent should be ongoing and uh, reversible. Also, uh, the XR users should be considered the owners of their own data. So this means that they have the right to determine how their data is being used, shared, or retained. And they should also have the ability to uh, easily transfer their data from one application to another, allowing them to maintain control and continuity of the personal information. So uh, like there is uh, another concern which I would like to detail here, which is data collection and storage, uh, in which, like as I mentioned before, a wide range of data is being collected by the XR uh, devices, which is being uh, sent to the uh, XR application. And this data can be uh, stored in remote cloud servers, for instance. So um, this uh, here in this scenario, we have to make sure that the application that is collecting the data, it should collect in a very minimized way, like only important data should be collected uh, and excessive and unnecessary data should be avoided in order to uh, not to breach the uh, privacy rights of the users and also uh, there is another concern which is known as transparency in which companies should be transparent uh, about their data practices. Like uh, they should uh, inform the users how they will be collecting data, how they will be using it, how for how long it can be retained and so on. So there should be clear communication uh, which would help users to build trust also. And last but not the least, we have like uh, the notion of sharing and third parties in which uh, if the data is shared uh, with the third party service, for instance, analytics and advertising, the user should be informed about this and they have the option to opt out, as I mentioned before. And there should be clear agreements and contracts that should be put into place to ensure that third parties also adhere to data privacy standards. Uh, so in November 2021, Facebook uh, announced that uh, they will delete all the face recognition data they have extracted from the images of 1 billion people who are currently using the applications. And people usually, they are not aware about that. Like we all make use of Facebook in our day-to-day -day life. Whatever pictures we are posting is being used somehow by the analytic companies to you know, conduct analysis to determine what are your likings and they will show advertisements uh, based on your uh, profiles. So uh, moving ahead uh, is about user tracking and profiling. Uh, which basically involves uh, the collection analysis and utilizes uh, utilization of users data to understand the behavior and preferences and interactions within the extended reality environment so while these practices can enhance user experience and of course uh, can offer personalized content they can also raise important privacy and ethical concerns so um, in this case, the uh, developers of the technology should consider implementing techniques to anonymize or de-identify user data whenever possible. So this will help protecting the privacy of the users uh, by preventing the direct association of the collected data with individual users. And of course, uh, XR applications might create user profiles based on behavioral data, which could include preferences, interactions, and patterns, as I mentioned before. So Transparency about the creation and use of such profiles is essential. And uh, one should avoid creating biased or discriminatory profiles that could lead to unequal treatment of the users, which is quite common in uh, social media applications these days. So uh, moving ahead, uh, we can also find some uh, safety related concerns in extended reality technology, uh, which are needed to be addressed to ensure a positive user experience and prevent uh, potential risks. So um, if you go through the scientific literature, the safety related concerns have been uh, categorized into psychological safety and physical safety. So let's quickly dive into the psychological safety aspects. So this can include simulated stress and anxiety. For instance, when um, users are making use of um, extended reality devices that involve high pressure situations or simulate anxiety inducing scenarios, for instance, horror games or dangerous situations, they can actually trigger real feelings of stress and anxiety in the users. And uh, you know, in such situations, overwhelming the senses with visual, auditory, and sometimes tactile stimuli is also being observed. 
uh, when experiments were conducted among a set of users who are uh, who were basically given these devices for testing reasons and also uh, it can also lead to social isolation where when the users are basically spending a lot of time in virtual environments uh, they may actually feel like they are being uh, segregated from the physical world so they they are basically feeling uh, a feeling of disconnection from the physical surroundings and also uh, some users may feel detached from their physical bodies or develop skewed senses on self while immersed in virtual environments so this will lead to uh, issues related to identity and self perception and this is not just common in uh, extended reality realm but also when we are making use of uh, any technical device if we are using too much of smartphones or we are you know uh, spending a lot of time in front of our uh, laptop screens then it can lead to um, all these consequences and moving ahead we have uh, physical safety concerns so uh, when users are actually using the devices uh, they sometimes get uh, you know unawareness of the physical surroundings so as i mentioned like uh, like in oculus headsets uh, there was a possibility of potential collision with the obstacles in the surrounding uh, we have so we are not aware that the object is actually lying and then we end up you know colliding with the object and also it can lead to physical strains and fatigue because if you are spending uh, too much time in uh, using extended reality devices in certain postures then it can lead to headaches or neck strains etc and uh, also it can lead to seizures and epileptic reactions where sometimes uh, there are flash lights uh, for instance in one of the cases which is indeed a very old uh, uh, scenario in which in japan uh, approximately 600 uh, people they were kids basically and they they faced seizures because they were being uh, displayed with pokemon cartoon and suddenly there was a flashlight whenever you see in cartoons uh, they are uh, the characters are fighting so they will be uh, immersing a very strong flash wave so they all of them they experience seizure because of that and also emulation of risky activities um, will also lead to uh, you know false sense of confidence like people will feel okay we are so confident we are so encouraged but they're not actually aware of the unsafe uh, behavior in the real world so when they actually step into the real world with the same level of confidence they may end up you know um, risking their lives so uh, apart from the safety concerns we may have legal and ethical implications also due to the immersive and transformative nature of the extended reality uh, environment so there are various aspects of intellectual property rights that can come into play in the context of extended reality uh, for instance we have uh, legal concerns which involve protecting uh, copyright trademarks and patents for xr contents technologies and innovations and it is indeed essential to prevent unauthorized use and ensure proper attribution of the content and also we have uh, ethical concerns in which uh, recognizing and respecting the intellectual property uh, property rights of the creators and developers it will foster a culture of innovation and fairness so um, xr content creators and developers they can hold the copyright over their creations and this will uh, include 3d models characters animations and so on and also there are brands that can utilize xr to create unique and immersive branding experience so they can protect their trademarks and this will include like logos and names and symbols uh, in order to uh, maintain the brand identity and then we have like innovations related to the hardware software algorithms and techniques that can be patented to uh, in order to protect the unique inventions and processes and finally we may have trade secrets also that are proprietary algorithms for instance or technologies that can be safeguarded from unauthorized access or disclosure so uh moving ahead uh, we have seen uh, you know safety security privacy related concerns in the extended reality environment so uh, we have also issues related to cyber bullying and harassment so in the virtual worlds like users can create avatars and digital personas so i, I think some of you might have experienced uh, in gaming situations where people can actually create or simulate their own characters and in such situations like 
harassment can involve unwanted interactions verbal abuse and inappropriate behaviors which will be directed to these characters these avatars or users and in xr experiences that include voice or text chat capabilities they can also be used for cyber bullying including spreading rumors hate speech or offensive language and uh, xr platforms with social features they can also be used for publicly shaming people and uh, for humiliating for embarrassing others or causing emotional harm um, and uh, last but not the least there can be image manipulation revenge also where uh, people can actually simulate avatars to engage in cyber bullying revenge or uh, humiliation so uh, after having a look on all these concerns uh, what's the what's the future of this technology how we can address that because uh, the idea is to you know gaze into the horizon of security related possibilities that lie ahead as extended reality continues to reshape industries and human experiences so let's have a look on the possibilities. Um, so the first aim should be to emphasize the vital role of security in extended reality. And this will indeed will be related to uh, safeguarding user privacy and data protection in which um, like we can simulate an environment where users can actually move or interact or their emotions can be captured in a way that they will be following the data protection measures. So. Uh, the idea is to you know build trust and user confidence because XR is nothing but a social technical um, uh, idea in which uh, the technology and society or humans are interacting with each other. So when the users will have the confidence that their interactions are shielded from malicious intent, they can be more engaging uh, in the extended reality without hesitation. So this will be like related to forming trust and it will create a bedrock upon which uh, the industries who are developing extended reality technology, they can thrive and innovate. And uh, the idea should be uh, to prevent cyber threats and attacks uh, that can be related to hacking of the XR hardware or software or you know, unauthorized access to data, which can be used to, try, uh, to lead to uh, unauthorized accesses and so on. And, uh, uh, last but not the least, counteracting virtual asset theft and fraud, where XR will introduce novel landscapes and uh, it's it's creating a real world value to the user. So protecting these assets from the threat uh, of unauthorized manipulation is also vital. And for that, there can be improvement in the robust security protocols in order to ensure that the data or the information that is being collected should uh, fulfill the norms of integrity. And if you guys are aware, uh, recently, like Apple Vision Pro uh, has been, uh, it's, it's been coming into the news, which is basically an MR uh, mixed reality headset developed by Apple. And they claim that they have like uh, introduced enhanced security and privacy related features. So of course, that would be an interesting area of research for the scientific community. And uh, yeah, the, this device will be coming to the market um, in the early 2024. So if you guys get a chance to, you know, buy this from the market, if it's not very expensive, then uh, go ahead, try having a, an experience uh, of using it. And yeah, I, as part of scientific con uh, community, I would love to uh, explore the, you know, security related stuff for this device. And, uh, uh, the idea is basically to ensure uh, responsible and secure XR adoption in the end. So for that, uh, important points that should be pondered are uh, responsible content creation in which uh, people who are actually collecting information uh, from the users and they are creating content based on uh, that, they should adhere to the ethical guidelines and standards. So for that, there should be uh, mechanisms implemented to report or remove any inappropriate or harmful content. So uh, also, uh, since in the extended reality realm, there are devices that are interacting with each other uh, through networks. For instance, we may have smartphones, we may have laptops, we may have extended reality headsets and so on. So they are having different configurations. Each device will be having a different kind of operating system or any software plugins and so on. So for that, there should be a homogeneity uh, in terms of security features. So that can be uh, you know, implemented on all these diverse devices. 
and they can interact with each other uh, in a uniform uh, way such that the policies will be secured there will be device management there will be access control features and so on and last but not the least there should be um, a continuous improvement in terms of the security features of these devices because extended reality is still an evolving technology so uh, the users the developers in the end they should be informed about the trends about the best practices and emerging risk uh, in this context uh, and last but not the least uh, in, there is an importance of collaboration and vigilance in which people uh, the community who's actually involved in the development of extended reality and who are uh, using these uh, technology uh, they are collaborating together to share a diverse perspective they can share their experiences so they can you know work upon creating holistic solutions that will be uh, applicable throughout and for that uh, like one can anticipate emerging threats for instance there are zero knowledge uh, proof techniques for unknown attacks for which there are no patches so far because it's still an emerging technology so one can work on this uh, dimension and one can also uh, uh, work on developing proactive security measures so vigilance basically prompts ongoing assessment and vulnerability testing, for instance. So the idea is to develop a robust security measures to safeguard users' uh, data and experiences. And of course, uh, societal norms and expectations are uh, continuously evolving. So vigilance should uh, stay attuned to these shifts by adapting the policies and practices accordingly to maintain the user's trust. And last but not the least, uh, as XR technologies are becoming more immersive, they raise ethical dilemmas. So vigilance uh, prompts critical examination of these dilemmas, helping to navigate the intersection of technology and ethics. So uh, from the developer point of view, there are some other uh, points that I would like to quickly share with you. Uh, there should be a promotion towards secure development and coding which will involve adoption of techniques like threat modeling or uh, secure architecture design, and also to validate uh, the inputs that are received from the users. Because uh, often uh, users will be providing feedback after um, you know, using these XR devices. So those inputs should be considered carefully in order to improve uh, the technology behind and to ensure a safe and secure immersive experience. And for that, developers can also make use of code reviews in which uh, there can be thorough reviews to identify security vulnerabilities and best practices violations. And in the end, uh, the idea is also to educate users uh, to make them aware about the potential risks of using these devices. So as I mentioned, like there are psychological and physical safety issues. So users should be aware of those concerns. And also uh, regarding the data collection practices, there should be compliance with the data protection regulations. So for instance, uh, I don't know if you are aware about the GDPR, which is General Data Protection Regulation. It has been passed in Europe, and it is being followed by all the industries that are making use of, or that are collecting the user-specific data for their technological improvements. So each industry has to follow uh, this GDPR regulation in order to ensure that the user data will be collected for the right purpose, and it will be uh, kept securely. And also, like, um, in United States, there is a regulation which goes by California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, which will be basically defining, defining guidelines to collect, process, and share the personal data of the user. So all these regulations should be kept into mind uh, before developing this technology. And uh, of course, uh, to ensure safe XR hardware and software equipment is also a need of today. So uh, the idea is to uh, improve the quality of service for the users to ensure that they are uh, having you know, comfortable experience while using the technology. And it should also uh, be like uh, making the devices fit and adjustable for the users based on their profile. If there are people uh, who are aging or people who are uh, comprising the kids they should uh, customize these devices based on the profile of the users in the end. And uh, lastly, uh, here is like a summary of uh, what you can find in order to improve your understanding of the technology, because 
because of lack of time i could not share or go into very much technicalities so if some of you are interested you can explore some courses online for instance on coursera there is a course on extended reality for everybody it's a specialization by university of michigan and there are of course financial aids available for these courses that you can apply for and also in neptel uh, which is in india again uh, you can find a really good course by a professor in iit madras on virtual reality engineering and people who are interested in developing stuff they can also explore some software development kits for instance uh, by amazon there is a kit called samarin then unity software is there then uh, on github you can find wall software and finally the virtual reality toolkit so uh, all in all like uh, the idea is to give you an awareness of some of the jargons in this uh, realm and of course if you have any questions you can uh, ask now or you can feel free to reach me out if you are interested in knowing what exactly i'm doing as part of the sarmas project because this project is basically uh, dealing with the Uh, development of socially acceptable extended reality systems and models so i'm currently working from the mathematical side of it or analysis of security so feel free to uh, reach me out through linkedin or by my personal email id for any questions yeah thank you very much for your patience and uh, i would you can proceed ahead yeah participants any questions from your side we can give it through chat abinav will be sharing it through whatsapp group Yes. So moving forward, uh, thank you, ma'am, for cultivating and enlightening audience with your technical talk. Ma'am, I'm audible, right? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for cultivating and enlightening audience with your technical talk. I take the privilege to propose word of thanks on behalf of I Triple E Education Society YP Committee and I Triple E Professional Communication Society YP Committee, and I. Thank Dr. Mega Man for delivering a talk on securing immersive experiences, uh, communication in extended reality worlds. I would like to take a moment of, uh, I would like to take a moment to express our gratitude to Dr. Mega Man, uh, and she well explained about uh, Google Cardboard SDK, Oculus Go headset, Metaverse. She also defined extended reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. she also explained about the applications of xr airbus a320 malware and ransomware threats deep fakes and misinformation ma'am has well explained about uh, data privacy and personal information of users data collection and storage safety concerns legal and ethical implications uh, thank you ma'am uh, like ma'am is my screen visible ma'am uh, not yet Yeah, now it's fine. On uh, this note, I would like. Ma'am, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. So on this note, I would like to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Mega Ma'am for sharing her experience and insightful session on securing immersive experiences. Thank you, Ma'am, for giving us your time. Thank you once again for accepting our invitation. Sincere gratitude to IEEE Education Society and IEEE Professional Communication Society team for making this event a successful one. As we wrap up the event, I would like you to invite to stay a little longer for for a special moment. Let's go for a photo session. For that, I would I request everyone to turn on the cameras. Participants. Can you please turn on your cameras? Let's go by count: three, two, 
Thank you all. Thank you everyone. Last but not least, I would like to appreciate all the volunteers for contributing to make this event possible. Thank you once again for your time and support. We hope you enjoyed the event and gained valuable knowledge and insights from our speakers. Thank you all for being a part of this event. We hope that you have had a productive experience and we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Your presence and engagement made it a great success. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Sonny. Thanks all for your presence. Have a nice evening. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. Stay safe and healthy. Bye.